Hey ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining me once again and welcome back to Dominion's 5 Strategy. Today, in a video uh, originally sponsored by Zhenyanez, another one of my Patreon supporters, thank you very much dude, we'll be talking about units, about troops, and specifically about troop analysis and counters. It's an interesting subject, um, mostly because, well, the kinds of things that you really want a unit to be able to do change a lot over the course of a game. Uh, not entirely, but largely. You know, the, the kinds of things that you look for in a unit in the expansion phase are not always the same as you look for a unit during your first war or as you look for, you know, later in the game. And in general, in general I would say that basically in the very early game you're kind of looking for... Well... <sighs> Let's take a look at some units, actually, because it's a little bit hard to describe. First of all, what I'm going to start with, I'm going to start by looking at some some very good units and then some very bad units in the same era, and we'll talk about why they're good versus why they're bad. The main quality you're looking for in a, a unit, uh, a troop, is efficiency, generally speaking. And this is why Middle Age Ulm is widely considered, not by everyone, I suppose, but Many people would consider Middle Age Ulm to be one of the, the nations with the very best troops in the game. And that's largely because of these guys, the Black Plate Infantry. Black Plate Infantry are, while they are a little bit slow to mass because their resource cost is very high, in terms of gold cost, they're incredibly efficient. And when I say that they're incredibly efficient, what I mean is, um, against a wide variety of threats, they last a longer time than you would expect, based on their gold cost. And they also do more, well, they don't do a ton of damage, but they can do some damage back while not dying. And not dying is essentially, I would say, one of the paramount characteristics of a good unit. A, a solid unit, a, a strong unit, a unit that you will want to recruit a lot of over the course of a game, is one that doesn't die in a variety of circumstances. Because, of course, even if a unit hits very hard, even if it does a lot of damage, even if it can can counter certain threats effectively, um, if it's easy to kill, it still becomes, you know, difficult to use effectively. Especially because as the game progresses, the battlefield becomes more and more lethal to standard units. So if you look at Black Plate Infantry, the one thing that stands out for Black Plate Infantry, well, there's two things actually. The first is their protection score. Protection is super, super high. It's 23. This is, I believe, the highest protection in the game for a standard, like, recruitable troop. There are certain mages that can get higher. Um, there are certain summons that have higher protection. Like, particularly, I think, troll kings have 24. Um, and, of course, earth mages can push their protection higher with the use of buffs. You can make commander's protection higher by stacking magic armor on them. You can get people up to 30 or 30-plus 30 protection, all the way up to potentially 40. But 23 is the highest of any recruitable troop. And in particular, 23 is high enough that most standard infantry, most other units, will have a very, very hard time punching through it to do HP damage. Um, so a Black Plate Infantryman, even though he has a garbage, garbage low defense skill, and so is going to get hit by almost every strike, most strikes he will just shrug off. Let's say you have a you know, a standard, I don't know who has a standard unit, like a standard Spearman here with just 13 piercing damage. 13 piercing damage is not enough to hurt this guy almost ever. 13 pierce versus 23 protection, lowered by 20% because it's piercing damage. You end up rolling 13 versus, I believe, 19 or 18. In any case, you're rolling at 5 or 6 minus on 2d6, essentially. Your odds of scoring damage through that 23 protection is very low. Um, and so, these Black Plate Infantry, in a fight against Spearmen of that kind, or Swordsmen, who are hitting with 16 slashing damage, 15 or 16 most of the time, um, any of those guys fighting Black Plate Infantry just won't accomplish much, because they don't hit hard enough to do damage. The Black Plate Infantry, on the other hand, hits with 16 blunt, and gets an attack bonus versus shields, plus gets two attacks. So, high attack density, so does a reasonable amount of damage back, and very, very difficult to actually hurt when you're fighting those kinds of standard units. Uh, as a result, Black Plane Infantry will mulch through most other human infantry without much trouble. Um, they, they won't take many casualties in the process, uh, and at the very least, even if they're uh, up against another unit that they have trouble hurting, 
at the very least, they will form a wall and prevent the enemy from pushing through to attack your mages or your support troops. So in that sense, these guys are very good. And these guys are very good because, as I said, high protection and, and this is just as important, low gold cost. Uh, low gold cost means you can recruit a ton of these guys. Their upkeep is low. Their upkeep is no higher than any other standard human infantry unit. So you can afford to support hundreds of these units if you need to um, without destroying your economy. And as you shift towards the mid and late game, that becomes a huge consideration. There are many units out there that are very strong in some ways, but have huge upkeep costs. And so overall, I would say, aren't worth it in a lot of situations. Uh, for an example, we were just looking at Man. The Knight of Man here, he costs 40 gold, which isn't super high for heavy cavalry, but still means his upkeep cost is 32 gold per year. What that means is that for every three or four Knights of Man you have around, you could be paying the upkeep on another mage. Um, and that becomes a significant limiting factor. Uh, this is not to say that Knights of Man are necessarily bad. They're not, necessarily. But you can't just pump them out all the time like you can with Black Plate Infantry. Or especially, Knights of Avalon. Knights of Avalon are more powerful than Knights of Man, and in, in a way, they're actually a better investment because they recuperate, which means that if they get injured but don't die, they'll recover from their wounds over time which is a great quality, but they cost 60 gold. So they cost a lot to recruit and they have a lot of upkeep. And those are both very, very negative qualities for troops. Um, that said, these are very much kind of specialty high-end troops. If we're talking about general units, um, definitely the quality you want to be looking for most is survivability. Uh, or, or rather, survivability per gold cost, if that makes sense. Um, it's okay if you have a unit that doesn't have great survivability, as long as it's also not expensive. If you have an expensive unit that doesn't survive well, that's a bad unit. So, you know, we've, we've looked at, so we look at the Black Plate Infantry, right? Low cost, extremely survivable, generally speaking. There are counters, obviously, armor negating damage, like uh, shock damage goes straight through this. He doesn't have any elemental resistances, so in the mid and late game, combat magic can really do a number to these guys. But since they're so cheap, it's not a huge problem. Then let's look at Bandar Log. Bandar Log's units, say for example, let's look at the, uh, the Light Bandar Warrior. The Light Bandar Warrior in some ways has some things, has some, some better qualities than that Ulmish Black Plate Infantry we were looking at. It has high hit points, high strength. Uh, a reasonably good attack score, decent morale. That said, there's a big problem with the Light Bandar Warrior. There's actually two big problems. First of all, protection score is overall low. In particular, it has almost no head protection, and then 12 body protection. So, not super impressive, especially in an age where longbows and crossbows are becoming more and more prevalent. So, not going to resist a lot of damage. And secondly, it costs 16 gold. This is a problem because, as we just talked about, what you want for your troops is efficiency, is survivability per point of gold, per piece of gold, pound of gold. I think it's technically pounds of gold in Dominions, which says some fascinating things about the economy, frankly. But anyway, <laughs> leaving that aside, um, Light Bandar Warriors just aren't as good as Black Plate Infantry, or even Infantry of Ulm, the cheaper version that only have 19 protection. And it's basically down to the fact that they don't survive as well. Um, Prot 10, even with 18 HP, Prot 10 versus Prot 19 or Prot 23 just does not cut the mustard. And what it means is there's a lot of situations that you could throw Black Plate Infantry into and feel confident that they're going to survive for a good long time that you cannot put Light Bandar Warriors in. For example, if you have Light Bandar Warriors fighting Black Plate Infantry, the Black Plate Infantry will roll them. Because even though Light Bandar Warriors hit very hard, they still don't hit quite hard enough to overcome Ulmish Prot on average. Whereas Ulmish Infantry do hit hard enough to overcome Light Bandar Warrior Prot on average by a good bit. So two or three hits from Ulmish Infantry are likely to kill a Light Bandar Warrior. Whereas a Light Bandar Warrior is going to have to take, I don't know, eight or nine or ten hits to kill an Ulmish Black Plate Infantry, and that's at co that's even while he costs, you know, one and a half times as much. If you look at the, the heavier Bandar Warriors, these guys are a little better in that respect, in particular they wear hats, 
but you still have the problem that they're, they cost 16 gold. Um, and they lose their ranged attack, which is another... Uh, that's a quality that Light Bandar Warriors have that is actually fairly valuable. Um, but these guys, when they, when they put on hats, they forget how to use ranged weapons. Which is a little unfortunate. Also, I think their armor... Yeah, they have a heavier uh, body armor as well. So, these guys are a good bit tougher... But they don't have the ranged attack, and their um, their damage output just isn't really high enough to mesh up with the the still lowered survivability from Ulmish infantry. So in general, that kind of survivability is, I would say, the first quality that you want to look at. The second quality that you want to look at when you're analyzing troops is damage output. Um, overall, all things being equal, troops that do more damage are better than troops that do less damage because, well. When you hit hard enough, you can actually kill the enemy before they do a ton of damage back to you. So, for example, the Bandar Warriors with the Iron Cudgels. They do 26 damage a hit, which means these guys can actually punch through the very heavy armor of Olmish infantry or knights or etc. The very tough units that other people might try to use against you, these Bandar Warriors can knock holes in with their giant clubs. There is a trade-off for that. The trade-off for high damage typically is you don't have a shield, um, and shields are very important for dealing with ranged fire, which we'll talk about in a minute here. Um, the, the third kind of triumvirate, so we've got general survivability. I'm going, to, I'm going to form a little triangle here, right? We've got general survivability, we've got damage dealing, and we've got price. Those are kind of the, uh, kind of the, the initial triangle that you're analyzing for troops. Um, and this kind of gives you an idea as to why many Abyssian infantry, for example, are bad. Because Abyssian infantry cost a ton of gold. Um, have pretty high prop, but not super exceptional, combined with their low defense score. Um, and aren't, so they're not very survivable. They hit hard, but only one attack each, so their overall damage dealing capacity isn't super great. Um, and they're paying a lot extra for things that often don't matter much. Dark Vision, Wasteland Survival, um fire resistance, all that kind of stuff. Now, I'm about to say something that sort of contradicts myself here, and this is kind of part of why troop analysis in Dominions is very complicated. Um, elemental resistances can be extremely valuable in the sense that they can make troops uh, essentially punch above their weight survivability-wise, especially in the mid-game. As you move into the mid-game and as combat magic becomes more common, uh, elemental resistances become very, very important because elemental resistances are what helps your otherwise perhaps very efficient troops stay efficient or at least stay viable in the face of combat magic. For example, if you have cold resistance, then somebody casting, um, oh, what's that spell? Grip of Winter uh, doesn't bother your troops. You don't take the extra fatigue damage from it, at least not nearly so much. If you have fire resistance, then... Uh, you know, fire damage spells don't hurt you as much. So Abyssians, for example, have that specific strength that fire damage spells don't really hurt them because they have a ton of fire resist resistance. Unfortunately, the way Dominions works is almost every nation has multiple counters available to you. Like, the only time the enemy doesn't have another good way to attack your troops than fire magic is if they are also Abyssia. And if you're playing Abyssia, then they aren't playing Abyssia, unless you're playing in an all-nations game or some of something something like that. So, the Fire Resistance 25, in the case of Abyssian Infantry, actually ends up not giving them a lot of value. Because, when your opponent sees Fire Resistance 25, they go, Oh, so I won't use Fire Spells on these guys, and they switch to something else that you don't have resistance to. So, essentially... Fire Resistance 25 often ends up not mattering in the context of your troops. Something to keep in mind. But that said, and as I said a minute ago, elemental resistances can be very, very useful. We'll look at, for example, early age Tian Chi, if I can find them, assuming my, my eyes and brain are working. There they are. Warriors of the Five Elements have five elemental resistance to every element. This is very valuable. And this is a big part of what helps justify their very high gold cost. Warriors of the Five Elements, if you look at their stats, don't really don't really justify 35 gold. I mean, yes, they have decent stats. They have two attacks each, so high attack density, which is great. Um, and piercing damage half the time, fantastic. 
Um, defense skill is high, combat speed is high for infantry, attack skill is high, strength is a little higher than average. All that's fantastic. But they only have Prot 9 and they don't wear helmets. So you'd think that they would be very, very easy to kill. And in some ways they are. They're easy to kill with archers. Um, but they're not as easy to kill as you would think with elemental spells because they take five less damage from everything. They take five less damage from lightning bolts, from fire spells, from cold spells, from poison. They're a lot more resilient than you would think just from looking at them. Now, since their prot is so low and their HP is so low, attacking them with AoE damage spells is still one of the most efficient ways to counter them, and it is something that you still have to take into consideration. But that even that little five points of elemental resistance gives them a little bit more durability and allows them to actually get into melee. And once they get into melee, their damage output is so high that they can chew things up very quickly because they're launching two attacks, both of which are very likely to hit at decent damage scores every round. I mean, in particular, if you give these guys a bless for, you know, a plus strength bless or something like that, um, they can do a lot of damage very quickly. So in terms of infantry, it's efficiency that you're really looking for. And uh, if we wanted to look at early age Chin Chi's troops, for example, you can look at the basic footman here and you can look at him and say, okay, costs 10 gold, hits hard, but with a low attack stat. So actually his damage output is not that great because he's likely to miss. Stats, straight 10 across the board, only 10 protection. Eh, not so sure about this guy. Then we look at this guy. Okay, this is a little bit better. Defense skill of 14, so fairly tanky. Tower shield, very high parry value, so he's going to block arrows, a lot of arrows. For that usage, this guy is pretty good, in that he has, you know, he has high arrow deflection, he has decently high defense skill, otherwise his stats are very average, but he's got a very average gold cost. So, efficiency? Yeah, he's got some efficiency to him. Similarly, the Tianqi Archer, uh, 10 gold. Very, very basic, mediocre stats across the board, but he comes with a composite bow, which is one of the better bows in the game, and so his damage output at range is fairly high. So, pretty decent archer. These are both both in the solid category. Then you look at somebody like the Heavy Footman, and you go, okay, so the Heavy Footman, defense skill of 9, which is not fantastic, does have 15 prot, costs 20 resources though, so a little bit hard to mass, and unlike Middle Age Ulm, you don't have resource generating mages and you don't have a resource bonus in your forts. So it's going to be harder to amass that many resources. Eh, heavy footmen, eh, maybe not. Uh, these guys, potentially, 15 prop plus 13 defense skill. You could use them if you want something uh, just kind of a, a real heavy chaff wall and if you happen to have the resources for it. Um, since Early Age Chenchi is not a nation that tends to take a ton of production, maybe you won't have that many resources available all the time. So that will will kind of guide your decision making there. And I know it's it sounds a little contradictory for me to be saying that 20 resources are too many for a heavy footman when 38 are not too many for a black plate infantry. But as I said, middle age Ulm gets a lot more resources usually than early age Chen Shi does. And the difference between 15 and 23 in terms of protection is very significant. So, it's all kind of a balancing act, and it's it definitely is something that has to take into consideration the nations themselves, as well as the unit in isolation. Um, it's hard to talk about units in Dominions 5 in isolation, because sometimes the units that are really good in one roster would be bad in another. And it just kind of comes down to, to what nation in what era is facing what challenges, if that makes sense. Um, Machakan troops. Most of these guys are quite bad. Um, and a big reason is almost none of them wear armor. So like the Hyena Clan Warriors, 5 protection. The shield has low uh, protection value. To, to digress a little bit and to explain why this is such a problem. Parry value is a... Uh, a measure of how often the shield will get into the way of an arrow. So, what happens is, when you're shot with an arrow, or, well, actually when you're hit with anything, when you're hit with a weapon, you have a defense skill value, this is your base defense skill here, minus your defense modifiers, a measure of how heavy your equipment is, and then you have your shield parry that adds up to it. 
What this is saying here is this Hyena Clan Warrior actually has a defense skill of 8. 10 minus 2. If he rolls... Essentially, if he rolls with below... It's hard to explain since we're, we're using a, a 2d6 system. There's a range within which you can roll essentially over 8, but under 14. If you roll under 8 when you're attacking somebody, the attack misses completely, and no further damage is rolled, because that's his defense skill. If you roll under 14, the attack actually still hits, because it's but it's hit the shield, because it's come in under the shield parry modifier. What that means is that the attack is rolled against a protection value composed of the protection of the shield plus the protection of the unit's armor. So this is why units like this are much weaker than they actually appear, because that defense skill of 14 is a lie. And the shield, which makes up almost half of that defense skill value, has very low protection. So effectively, a Hyena Clan Warrior actually has a protection value of 16 against about half the attacks that hit, that, that miss, quote-unquote, but have actually hit the shield. Um, a lot of units can punch through protection 16. And that's why Hyena Clan Warriors are quite weak. Similarly, Lion Clan Warriors. Lion Clan Warriors, likewise, same defense skill, same parry value, same weak shield. Um, about half the attacks that quote-unquote miss the Lion Clan Warrior because of his defense skill will actually still get to roll damage against Protection 16. And like I said, the early age is full of giants and monsters and even just really hard-hitting humans who can cut through Protection 16. On top of that, your shield can be damaged when the protection value is exceeded, uh, which makes it worse. And so, Lion Clan Warriors, Hyena Clan Warriors, Spider Clan Warriors, Machaka Warriors, all these guys will just get absolutely ripped down by hits that hit the shield and then carry right through because their shield is very weak. This is why the Rhino Clan Warrior is the strongest of the Machakan units, because if it parries with if, if a Rhino Clan dude parries with his shield, at least he has prop 22 to cut through, which is fairly unlikely to be pierced. Uh, can certainly still happen against giants in particular, but it gives him a lot more protection. That said, Rhino Clan warriors have quite low attack value with their one attack, um, so and they cost 13 gold, so well over average human gold cost for mediocre protection unimpressive overall stats, low damage output since attack value is low, uh, just not great. Very mediocre at best. And this is why the, the troop lineup here is considered bad, because, well, it is. Because all of these guys either have very low survivability or low damage output, or both. Even Lion Clan Warriors, Lion Clan Warriors have decent damage output, but their survivability is garbage. Uh, pygmies are about the best unit that Machaka has, and that's because while their damage output is low, their cost is incredibly low in terms of gold resources and recruitment points, so they're very cheap to create, and they're also very, very easy to mass. So if you want hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them, that's easy to do. Um, their short bows don't do a ton of damage, but in the early age where people don't have a ton of armor, they can still do chip damage, and you can easily cast flaming arrows on them to make them sort of weak crossbows. When you have three or four hundred of them, even weak crossbows will do the job, and since their upkeep is very, very little, a third of a gold per turn per pygmy, uh, you can afford to keep those hundreds of them floating around. Other troops besides human infantry like this have other strengths and weaknesses, like for example, war lions. War lions are an example of the, uh, the animal kind of motif. There are a variety of animal troops, they tend to share qualities of relatively low protection, very low magic resistance, and overall high damage output. So, War Lions, for example, are, in terms of durability, actually not great, despite having 20 hit points. So they have twice the hit points of a normal human, but about half the prot. It, or it averages out. However, their attack skill and strength are both quite high, and they get two attacks. So, War Lions have slightly above average human attack density, since you get two of them per square with two attacks each. Um, and those attacks hit fairly hard, and fairly accurately. So, in that sense, War Lions actually do quite a bit of damage. They are expensive, and they attrit away quite quickly. So, that has to be kept in mind. 
Um, the benefit of them is they're very fast and they hit hard. Unfortunately, they are undisciplined. If they were disciplined, they would be excellent flankers to set on attack rear orders. Since they're undisciplined, about all you can do is set them on the flanks and hope that they kind of curl around the edge of the enemy formation. But in general, um, animals and, and human infantry kind of have different different qualities that you're judging them on, because animals will tend to have that combination of low durability, high damage output. Um, and if they don't have that, then they tend to just kind of be bad, because they tend to have still low durability, but also low damage output. Uh, but the general efficiency question also holds even when you're analyzing, for example, giants. So let's look at, say, Avite Spearmen, or Avite... Light infantry have the javelins. Yeah, they both have javelins. Let's look at Avite Spearmen here. Avite Spearmen are, of course, a lot more expensive than human infantry, and yet they're still relatively worth it. I mean, 25 gold, so about two and a half times the cost of a human infantry, but they have decent protection. They also have a decent defense skill. Their shield has high enough prop that in combination with their protection, it can block off most attacks that hit it. Uh, they hit hard enough with piercing damage, that they can actually punch through pretty much any armor that another mass production troop is going to have. And they have javelins, so they have a ranged attack that they can throw in early and get some free damage un, uh, unharassed by the enemy at a pretty decent range. This won't, I mean, individually one guy's javelins won't hit all that often, but it will hit some and it will do some damage unanswered unless the enemy also has javelins. You can also get the Avite Light Infantry if you have fewer resources available. They're also reasonably efficient, a little bit more flimsy because of the lower prot, but if you're using them mainly for the javelin attack, then that can still be quite useful. Um, so this is an example of a fairly efficient giant troop. Um, they do suffer a little bit from lowered attack density, since they have only two melee attacks per square instead of three for humans, but their attacks are higher enough quality, slightly above average attack skill, significantly above average damage, um, that it, that kind of cancels out, and they have the durability from their high hit points and reasonable protection that they can survive a couple rounds of counterattacks, so these guys can fight off human infantry fairly effectively. And that's, that's a decent trade. Those are pretty solid. By contrast, Horite Champions. Horite Champions cost the same gold, they actually have slightly more hit points, and they have some elemental resistances, but at least in my opinion, that really doesn't counteract the fact that they have 7 protection and a defense skill of 9. They're going to get hit a lot, they're going to take a lot of damage when they do get hit. Um, they will do a lot of damage when they hit, and they'll hit an, a reasonable amount of the time. But even so, 25 gold for something that is probably going to die when it sees combat just isn't worth it for my blood. Even 20 gold, I mean, Horites are actually even worse because their attack skill is lower, and their prot is almost non-existent. So Horites and Horite Champions, those kinds of units, are really an example of something that has to be used only in a very specific context. In this case, if you have a cave that you want to defend, Horites and Horite Champions aren't a terrible idea because they only take minus one attack and defense in caves, as opposed to everyone else taking minus three who doesn't have dark vision. So, you know, if you have Horite Champions in a cave, they end up with attack skill 10, defense skill 8. Other people are ending up with attack skill 7, defense skill 6 or 7. Yeah, that kind of stat differential can make them worthwhile. But generally speaking, something with a stat line like this is something that you don't want to recruit if you can avoid it, just because it's going to die. Um, and it won't really pay off for you while it dies. Usually. Now, there is a unit in Shinoyama, the Obakemono, which people do use for this purpose, for the purpose of going into combat and dying. But I should point out, the Obakemono compared to the Horite Champion has slightly more hit points, more prot, higher morale, uh, and slightly higher strength, so it actually hits harder and takes less damage for the same gold cost. Now, it hits slightly less often, which is a valid, you know, a, a valid criticism, but even so, the Obakemono is a little bit better of a value proposition when it comes to just beating on other random units. And it should be noted, Obakemono are only really ever used for uh, early expansion and potentially for evocation baiting later in the game, since they have 
high hit points and relatively low defenses, so mages love to target them with evocation spells. But in terms of what's actually a good troop, Obakemono are not, generally speaking, a good troop. They're useful in the expansion phase, because they have qualities that allow them to fight other completely unsupported troops with reasonable effectiveness. High enough strength, hit points, prot, etc. They can do that job. What's a good troop in this lineup? There's actually two nowadays. Um, there used to be only really one choice, which is one of these two. Nowadays, these guys are actually pretty good troops. And the reason there is, uh, they're, uh, well, not, not these guys, I would say. These ones. Yeah, they have their prot average, attack skill average, strength and defense skill actually a little bit low, but their gold cost is low, only 8. They're slightly cheaper in mountains, which makes it actually 7 in mountains. Uh, and their weapon is very good. So they get, they have 11 attack skill, and they do 15 piercing damage, which is relatively high. That's good stuff for how cheap these guys are, and they're size 1, which means you can pack 6 of them into a square, get 6 attacks per square, and they'll do a lot of damage for their price. Now, it does give them a weakness, you know, it makes them weak to evocations, area of effect spells. Uh, something that hits a square full of Bakemono Show is going to wipe out six of them at a time, instead of three or two at a time, like with larger units. But, that said, I think it's a worthwhile trade-off. You don't see a whole lot of people spamming a ton of evocations in combat, um, and if you do, you can generally kind of spread these guys out a little bit to avoid taking the damage. So, these guys are good on the efficiency spectrum. They cost a small amount of gold, they're easy to mass up, and they do quite a bit of damage for their cost while having mediocre but acceptable survivability. On the other side, Daibakemono are expensive, 25 gold again, we're once again talking about size 3 giant troops, but they have pretty good protection, higher stats than average across the board, a longbow attack that does quite a bit of damage, and then an incredibly high quality melee attack. 13 attack, doing 26 slashing damage. That is very, very solid stuff. Also, like they like the uh, the uh, Bakemono show and the Obakemono, they can see in the dark, which is a nice little Benny. It doesn't really matter in most cases, but it's a nice little Benny. So, these guys, like I said, 25 gold, but 20 hit points and 17 protection, which is a great combination. Higher magic resistance and morale, so they'll stick around a little bit longer and they won't be as vulnerable to, like, astral magic. Uh, higher than average stats across the board. Very good strength. These guys are also quite solid. In terms of general unit analysis, I would say you can kind of split units up into a couple of categories, which I'll generically refer to as infantry, giants, and cavalry, okay? Infantry, generally speaking, you're looking for a gold price point of somewhere between, say, 9 and 12. You don't really want to be hiring a whole lot of infantry that cost, like, 14 or 15 gold. If you can get infantry that are cheaper, like Healit Warriors only cost 8 gold, absolutely do so. That's great. Healit Warriors are another example of a, uh, a unit that's good via efficiency. Their stats are unexceptional, their morale is low because they're slaves, but you can have Taskmasters to counteract that. Um, they have Javelin attacks and Axes, so they do quite a bit of damage, and since they're cheap, you don't care that they die. In particular, Healit Warriors are special because, of course, you can free spawn them with Flagrant Tyrants, in which case their cost is actually almost nothing. Um, effectively, you're paying, you know, the upkeep cost of a Phlegrin Tyrant, which is about 20 gold per turn, uh, for a number of Helot Warriors between, I think, 8 and 20, so count it as maybe 1 or 2 gold each. Very, very much worth it. Helot Soldiers, on the other hand, despite only costing 8 gold, you still don't see them recruited much, just because they don't offer a whole lot that's special. They have spears, but their spear attack is unexceptional, and yada yada yada, you see what I'm saying. Uh, the Helot Warriors are just better on the efficiency spectrum, and that's why you see them all the time, and you see these guys not very much. So, for infantry, somewhere between 9 or 8 or 9 to 12 gold, generally speaking, you're looking for high prot, because high prot is kind of the defining characteristic of an efficient human size infantryman. Um, high prot, prot is just generally good against all kinds of threats. It makes you last longer on the battlefield. If you can get elemental resistances, that's great, but elemental resistances at high levels tend to be very expensive. So, for example, Abyssian infantry pay through the nose for them, and I would say they pay more than it's worth. 
for monsters for giants size three or four um it's a little bit hard to come up with a general rule for size three infantry 20 to 25 gold is kind of the uh the general rule and a lot of the 20 to 25 gold size three infantry are actually quite efficient like colossi light infantry all that stuff these guys are pretty good as a general rule size four infantry is not very good for example you can look at the Jotuns here, like the Jotun Huskarls. Jotun Huskarls have decent stat lines, but they're just too expensive. You will run out of money if you're relying on these guys. They have prop 15, but they only have 11 defense skill. Um, they hit very hard, but only with average attack skill. So mainly they're just kind of leaning on having a high HP pool, which can work, but the problem is since they're size four, you can only fit one of them in a square. And if you only have one guy in a square, then that guy is going to be attacked a lot. And so that high HP pool is relatively less valuable because it's going to be tested more, if that makes sense. I would rather have two guys with 20 HP each in a square, or even three guys with 10 or 11 HP each in a square, than one guy with 30 HP, just because those three guys with 10 HP each will be splitting up the attacks more, um, they'll tend to have a little bit higher defense skill, they'll generally be able to absorb more damage than the one guy with his 30 HP who is going to be taking like six attacks per round. So Jotun Huskarls are more fragile than they look because they don't have any buddies. Now you can mix them with Veti, um, but Veti are also, they're efficient relatively speaking, seven gold for defense skill 12, eight prot, yeah okay, they don't do much damage though so they can't really wear the enemy down and they'll tend to get worn down themselves. So it's kind of a uh, Size 4 giant infantry have this significant weakness that they are hard to get the most out of because they're alone. Uh, Jotun Hirdman may be actually the betters because for that 5 extra gold you're getting 3 more points of prot and slightly higher defense skill. So these guys can survive quite a bit better. If I'm going to use Jotun units, I'm probably going to use Hirdman over Huskarls just because of that extra little little bit of survivability. Um, but so yeah, for size 3 giants, you're looking at like 20-25 gold, slightly a bit of human stats, you want to see 11-13 to 13 in terms of most stats, ideally also a ranged attack like a javelin. For size 4, you're kind of in a rough spot. You want to see the highest prop possible once again. Uh, you'd also like to, like one of the things that can make size 4 giants relatively useful is formation fighter. So for example, Makone. Giganti Hoplites are probably the closest thing to an efficient size 4 giant out there, largely because they have that formation fighter, and they have prot 21. So these guys can stack up on a square and really make it hard to kill them. That said, they don't have any elemental resistances. In particular, shock damage becomes a huge problem because these guys are expensive enough and valuable enough that they will be specifically targeted by things like Thunderstrike or air elementals, etc. Things that do damage that their protection will not save them against. I mean, even fire elementals can get through that, to be honest. Um, and that's a big problem with expensive troops in general, and one reason why you really want to lean more towards cheap and efficient rather than expensive and elite. Expensive elite troops will get wasted. Um, you know, Giganti Hoplites, someone summons 8 or 10 air elementals, they'll destroy your whole line. Uh, or fire elementals. They'll die because, I mean, you've got magic weapons, but they'll also destroy your whole line along with them. Um, or someone casts Thunderstrike on you 50 times, or etc, etc. There's a lot of counters to troops in Dominions 5. Only in the early game are troops really critical pretty much in any way. Um, by the late game, troops exist only as blockers for mages, realistically speaking. Um, this is also why the cavalry becomes less and less important as time goes on. So Var and Guard here are probably one of the best cavalry units in the game. They're very much worth their cost. They cost 40 gold for only 15 hit points, but they have decent defense skill plus high protection, good stats across the board. They have a lance charge, which means when they charge in early on, they hit incredibly hard. Um, the lance basically gives you a damage bonus, in this case since it's a heavy lance, equal to your strength when you first charge in, which means that this lance, when the Savarangard charges, actually does something like 30 damage, piercing, 
which means it can kill pretty much anybody if it gets even a little lucky. Uh, giants are not safe from a Savaran Guard Lance Charge, nobody is. So Savaran Guards are almost guaranteed to get a little bit of value right at the start of the battle. Uh, after that, they do have two melee attacks, so they have decent attack density. They also have a composite bow if you want to use it, although with Savaran Guard, I wouldn't really recommend it. Maybe if you have them on hold and attack, they'll fire a couple of arrows before they charge in, and that's about all I would do. But this is what you're looking for in Heavy Cavalry. Um, 40 gold is a pretty reasonable price point. It may go up to 50 or 60, depending. If it's 60, I generally wouldn't say they're super worth it. Uh, Knights of Avalon can be because they have the recuperation, but even so. What you're looking for in Heavy Cavalry is high protection, decent defense and attack skill, a lance, ideally, and then high combat speed. High combat speed is very, very valuable because what you're going to use these guys for is flanking around to attack enemy mages and archers. In the late game, when people have huge armies on the field of hundreds of units, and when the mages have gotten a lot of research done and are really, really good at wiping out whole armies, uh, these guys become much less valuable just because they can't do their job. They can't necessarily flank around in that same way. And if you do need someone to flank around and attack the rear, you have things like mass flight or summoning air elementals or summoned units that can already fly in order to do that. Um, and because there just generally isn't a way to flank around the double line of 300 enemy infantry. So, but in the early game and in the mid game, Savarin Guard and similar units can accomplish good things for you in that flanking role. If you want to counter them, well, let's back up for a second. I'll talk about that briefly kind of in its own section here. I know this video is running long. Um, but yeah, this is kind of what you're hoping for in terms of heavy cavalry. 40 gold is a decent price point. As high prod as you can get, decent defense skill, as high combat speed as you can get. Another example, Mouflon Cataphracts. Mouflon Cataphracts are somewhat worse, but they're a lot cheaper. 30 gold and slaves, so they're paying half upkeep, so their upkeep is only 12 per year. Yes, please, I'll take two. Um, this At this gold price and with the half upkeep, you can afford to spam Mouflon Cataphracts in a way that you cannot with most, most heavy cavalry. Uh, and with 18 prot and 15 defense skill, slightly higher than average, they can actually form kind of a core of your army. So there's sort of a price break point there. Now, of course, as late age Flegra, most of your money is going to be going into Lace Dragonian Tyrants probably anyway, because your income is going to be in the toilet from all your national event and the unrest that your Tyrants will cause. But even so, Mouflon Cataphracts are a very solid investment, and it's mainly because they get a 25% discount over other quote-unquote good heavy cavalry. So we've talked a little bit about what it is that makes good units. So the question then becomes how do you counter good units? A good infantry unit is one that's tanky, one that, that provides a solid core for the battle line. The way that you counter a good infantry unit is by a type of damage that it's not resistant to. In most cases, the easiest way to do this is with air magic by spamming either Thunderstrike or by summoning Air Elementals. Uh, trampling as a mechanic works very, very well on heavy infantry because trampling inflicts armor-piercing damage and the only thing that can stop it is defense score and your parry, your shield parry, doesn't count. So, those infantry units that are carrying big shields and wearing heavy armor that otherwise are efficient against the threats that infantry are meant to counter are very, very inefficient against being trampled. You don't generally want to use like trampling units like elephants in order to do this, trampling creatures that you recruit, because they have the problem of routing and then trampling back through your own lines. But air elementals are a fantastic way to get trampling damage on a high speed chassis so he tramples more that's also resistant enough to most enemy attacks that it can manage to get several rounds of trampling in and kill a number of the enemy. Uh, Thunderstrike is another excellent, excellent uh, counter. Thunderstrikes drop fairly accurately, they do a lot of damage including AoE, and they can paralyze the enemy, or stun them rather, which breaks up the enemy formation and prevents the infantry from doing their job of forming a wall in between you and the enemy mages and archers. So air magic is a preeminent infantry counter in that sense. Um, that said, you can also just counter infantry with your own infantry as long as you've stacked better buffs on them, and stacking buffs is a huge part of Dominion's combat. In order to counter giants, honestly, I would say the best way to do it is with crossbows. Giants are relatively larger targets. Um, 
and in terms of and the, their shield, they don't tend to have better shields. So when arrows are being fired at a square, when an arrow lands in a square, essentially what who in that square the arrow hits is determined randomly. So every square has six size points available in it, right? Size three giants like that occupy three of those size points. A size six units occupies them all. Infantry, human size infantry occupy two of them. Okay, so if you have a square of three human size infantry, when an arrow hits that square, it will be randomized between all three of them. If it hits a square that has two size three giants in it, it will still be randomized, but it's guaranteed to hit one of them, as long as there's two people in the square. It will just hit either one or the other. What this means is that a square with two giants in it, each of those giants will take more of those arrows than a square of three human-sized infantry would. You know, if you have six arrows hitting a square with two Colossi Light Infantry in it, as opposed to a square with three Tianxi Infantry, then each of these Colossi Light Infantry will take three arrows instead of two. If you've got crossbows firing at them, that means that your crossbows will start doing chip damage very quickly, because even if they parry the arrows, that's still effectively 26 prot halved minus 20%. Actually, I think the minus 20% might not apply to shields. That may still be bugged. I'm not certain. But in any case, you're still looking at, you know, prot of somewhere between 10 and 13 against the crossbow bolts. You will start to rack up some chip damage there. Um, and... The Colossi Light Infantry, of course, won't be dealing damage back quite as quickly since they only have two guys attacking back at you or throwing javelins or what have you instead of three in the terms of human infantry. Um, since giant infantry are spread out more than human infantry are, AoE damage spells aren't quite as efficient. So, like, I mean, Thunderstrike still works because Thunderstrike is brokenly powerful. But, uh, you know, Falling Fires, Falling Frost, uh, Cloud of Death, Shadow Blast, those kinds of spells don't work quite as well. They have more HP to tank it and fewer units in a given a AoE to take damage. Um, massed crossbows or massed archers under flaming arrows or what have you are, I would say, generally a pretty good counter to giants um, since there are fewer targets to kill. And they're, while they are more durable than humans, they're not incredibly more durable than humans per gold cost. So you can kind of break through the line a little bit more quickly. To counter cavalry, you really have to have fast flankers of your own, or you have to have spells that impede mobility. So, uh, Earth Grip, or the, the Earth Meld, which is the larger AoE version. Maws of the Earth, which is the higher level version that also does a ton of damage. Um, those spells work quite well at locking down cavalry. The goal for fighting cavalry is to prevent them from getting off that lance charge on something valuable. So, you can either do this by bubble wrapping your mages and archers in lots of cheap disposable shit units, if enemy cavalry has to sit there fighting cheap disposable shit units for hours, they won't do well. They don't tend to trade perfectly well in those kinds of situations. Um, or hit them with mobility slowing spells, which will break them up as they come in. Once again here, Thunderstrike is actually really, really good, because not only will a Thunderstrike kill whoever's in the square that it hits, generally speaking, it also has a significant chance to stun some of the others and break up the cavalry charge so that instead of a mass of 15 or 20 cavalry units hitting you all at once and overrunning your flank, you have a dribble of four or five at a time that you can swarm under and handle with Skelospam or just tons of cheap infantry or something. In general, to kind of wrap up, because like I said, I know this has gone quite long, in general, troops are not the big thing when it comes to a Dominion's Nation. If you're analyzing a Dominion's Nation, the troops are actually quite secondary. Troops matter in the early game, and the quality of troops you have access to matter in the early game, in like turns 0 through 20, or 18, or 24, whatever you want to, to say there. Beyond that, the qualities that make for a strong game are increasingly encapsulated in your mage core, and your troops begin to matter less and less for a couple of reasons. First of all, as your magic becomes more powerful, your mages become a lot better at killing the enemy than your troops do. And secondly, um, troops become just unable to survive. You can't, without very, very significant magical support, most nations just don't have troops good enough to survive the, the focused displeasure of enemy mages. So, you know, if you're playing as Patala, I'm sorry, none of these guys matter much. 
None of them. Uh, you will recruit them because you have to use them, but the fact of the matter is, in order to accomplish anything in the game, you're going to be leaning mainly on gurus with yogi support and with, uh, you know, Nagari Nagaraja and Nag Naginis and Nagarishis mixed in to do the job they need to do in supporting those troops. But these troops are only really relevant at that point once you've stacked a lot of buffs on them. Once you get this guy with, you know, marble warriors and strength of giants and perhaps ethereal body ethereal on him, then he becomes dangerous. But he would be dangerous with those three buffs on him no matter what his stats were. So the stat line really doesn't matter so much in the later game. And that is, I think, one of the one of the really most important things you have to realize is that early on in the game, yes, absolutely, what your troops are matters. You have to pay attention to what your troops are and what their capabilities are. As you proceed later into the game, that matters less and less and less. And by the end game, most of the time, you won't really be using national troops anyway. You'll be out of money. Your cash will be spent on recruiting mages. You won't even be able to recruit mages in all your forts. You'll be summoning a lot of your troops. You'll be using uh, armies made up of, you know, summoned creatures and free spawn. And you'll be spamming skeletons or you'll be, be calling down demons or etc, etc. You'll be doing a ton of things that do not involve recruited troops that you pay for with gold. Because all your gold will be going to infrastructure and mages. So by the late game, all this troop analysis stuff is much less important than you might think. But in any case, thank you all for uh, listening to my rambling. I hope this has been useful or informative in some way. Please leave comments down below. I'm sure there's stuff that I've missed or that I haven't talked about sufficiently or that you'd like to bring up. Bring up points in the comments. I love having people bring up stuff that I overlooked or, uh, or, or talked about incorrectly even just because it really helps people learn. And that's what these videos are about is helping us sort of collate our knowledge and help people learn and figure out how to get into this game. So thanks so much once again. I'll see you in the next one.